Yeah, do people show up at these? Rarely. I see. Yeah, rarely. I mean, just the folks that are appearing before them for items on their agenda. Or sure. Typically. I got you. Yeah. You never have like a mob in here. Well, I mean, that does happen if there's something controversial.
three. We have open session <clears throat> this morning till roughly around 11. Then we're going to go into uh, a work session for the budget right afterwards down in uh, the Reagan room 003. We will recess and then reconvene at 1 p.m. to continue the work session. But as we always do, let's um, stand for a Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. Pledge of Okay, uh, first and foremost, wishing everybody a very happy Passover that celebrates uh, Chag Sameach and uh, upcoming very happy Easter to you, your family, and friends, and especially our great community. Let's start with uh, Priority Carol. We do have a couple of proclamations we'll do after the Priority Carol, uh, so I expect the Priority Carol to be relatively short this morning. Commissioner Vigliotti. I will certainly be as short as possible. Commissioner Rothstein, happy Passover to you. Happy Easter to anybody who celebrates that or Passover. Uh, over the course of the past week, I attended the Easter egg hunt in Tawnytown where over 4,000 eggs were hidden and they were found in about four seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I also had the pleasure of attending the annual Union Bridge Fire Company banquet. Uh, Mayor Perry Jones hosted and it is always a uh, wonderful time to be with the volunteer fire companies and that is it from me for this morning. Okay, Commissioner Kyler, what's in your and, mind? And again, Happy Easter, Happy Passover. Um, I did attend a Christian Farmers Outreach Luncheon, and uh, I attended Reese Fire Call Reese Fire Company's 75th anniversary, which was awesome. Their building was full. We we gave them a proclamation. So did the state, and and it was great. Thank you. Standing, Commissioner Gordon. Thank you. Uh, happy Passover and happy Easter to everyone that celebrates. Um, first and foremost, on Tuesday, I attended the, uh, I guess I would say, rededication of the Y Oak Tree out here on the outside of the uh, county office building. Mr. Larry Hogue reached out to the county government to uh, see that a sign was replaced. Apparently the sign had gone missing a number of years ago. Uh, the concern was obviously that if there's no signage, the tree could accidentally be taken down. Uh, the original Y Oak tree has been uh, gone for some time now in Maryland, even though it is the Maryland State tree. Uh, it was kind of an interesting uh, event that morning as uh, his son David Hogue was a Eagle Scout with the troop that uh, planted that tree on April 4th of 1987 in honor of Carroll County's 150th birthday. Uh, his son Dave was there as well. Uh, a little interesting piece of history was, and I didn't realize it at the time when we were first reached out to regarding this, uh, the scout troop is Troop 381. Uh, was also my scout troop when I uh, was in scouting, and I also became an Eagle Scout uh, through that troop. Uh, that troop, unfortunately, is no longer in existence, but uh, that troop did uh, uh, have 120 Eagle Scouts in its uh, long line of history. And to put that in context, only roughly 6% of all Scouts will earn the rank of Eagle. Uh, also, thank you to facilities and also Brad Weikert for seeing that the sign was uh, able to be replaced. Truly appreciate that. And then I have one little piece of information that I think will be very of, of a lot of interest to anyone in the community, Rex and Park wise. I, I'm going to have to take a little bit for Commissioner Kyler's district. I don't know if he's heard this news yet or not, but I spoke to uh, Will Richards, the CEO and president of uh, Dill Dinker's Pickleball, and uh, we are getting pickleball in uh, Figsburg. The, uh, the location will be the uh, former indoor tennis property down there in Finksburg that's going to be transformed into pickleball uh, courts and of course pickleball is one of the uh, largest growing uh, sports nationally so for those of you that are interested in pickleball and trying to find locations we are getting one in Finksburg and, and they're playing in North Carroll also. yes correct yep okay thank you hold on uh, Commissioner Garing uh, thank you good morning Carroll County two things briefly I, I want to commend our fire stations 
and all our chiefs and all our volunteers uh, on their continuing efforts to, to train on issues that are uh, some, some of them are new, uh, some of them are existing. Saturday morning, I was able to attend several different fire companies coming together at South Carroll High School to do a walkthrough of that solar array that's there up on the hill. Uh, I want to commend the, uh, the solar company for coming out and walking the, the firefighters through, going over uh, how they operate, uh, how they would respond to certain contingencies and certain emergencies. And what was apparent to me in that training was that there's a lot of maintenance and there's a lot of monthly and weekly check-ins on those types of facilities that go on. So obviously we'll be looking at that as we move forward because everyone's aware of our efforts. Uh, to uh, address that issue in the county and how we're going to, uh, or if we're going to make any decisions on that. And then secondly, one of the joys of becoming a commissioner has been getting to know what the Boys and Girls Club of Carroll County does. Fantastic organization. The facility here in Westminster is great, and they're expanding out. So on Wednesday, I had the honor of being down at the Mount Airy Middle School doing some uh, mock interviews, if you will. No, actually, they weren't mock interviews. We were interviewing the youth of the year for the Mount Airy Middle School. Uh, we did choose somebody. I don't want to preempt the announcement, but uh, it, we had nine or 12 of the, uh, of the members that wanted to interview for that position. And uh, there's six, seventh, and eighth graders, and it's just a fantastic organization. So if you're not familiar with Boys and Girls Club of Carroll County, please Please make yourself familiar with it because they are doing some just incredible work. And that's it for me. Thanks. Thanks. Just putting in context that solar array by South Carolina, do you know the acreage? You know, that's interesting because I asked the gentlemen that were there, who, by the way, were extremely helpful. I, I want to say it's around 10 or so acres. It's not that big. Right. Uh, but it was just an it was interesting to see the amount of maintenance and things that do go on behind the scenes and, and, and how firefighters would respond appropriately to an issue there so yeah I all, just because a lot of the conversation we've been having has been on acreage and just to put it in yeah. perspective but thanks um, the um, one thing I just want to share is on Friday I attended um, out on Slacks Road down Sykesville there's a second chance um, thoroughbred rescue farm and it's basically off the track thoroughbreds they bring them there and care for them it's a national organization um, but what's really cool about this one is it's second chance for both the horses and for individuals they take folks out of the correctional facility just down the road um, the state correctional facility and they teach them skilled um, uh, a skilled trade on taking care of horses uh, and it's a trade craft that can definitely be used once they leave uh, the incarceration. The recidivism uh, of these individuals is very, very low. They take about five, six at a time, and uh, now um, four or five, whatever. And um, on Friday, I was at the graduation of four of them, and listening to what they want, what they had to share. Uh, you know it's, it's pretty impressive so giving second chance to those that are incarcerated in programs whether it's vehicles for change as auto mechanics or in this case with uh, the thoroughbreds uh, it's just a great opportunity because it lessens the uh, you know the recidivism and the um, the incarceration which it's a whole lot less money you know to us um, but definitely um, a shout out to the community of volunteers, the uh, executive director, um, to the thoroughbred um, rescue, um, and all those involved to making this happen. But it was just a very uh, impressive event. Okay, see, we can do priority count in less than 15 minutes. <laughs> Let's go with. Um, uh, we have a couple of proclamations. Let's go with the first proclamation. That's Public Safety Telecommunicators Week Proclamation. Okay, so we have the National Public Safety Telecommuters Week Proclamation. Whereas emergencies can occur at any time that require police, fire, or emergency medical services, and whereas 
When an emergency occurs, the prompt response of police officers, firefighters, and EMS provide providers is critical to the protection of life and preservation of property and whereas the safety of our police officers, firefighters, and EMS providers is dependent upon the quality and accuracy of information obtained from citizens who contact the Carroll County Emergency Communications Center and whereas public Public safety telecommunicators are the first and most critical contact our citizens have with emergency services and whereas public safety telecommunicators are the vert, excuse me, vital link for our police officers, firefighters, and EMS providers by monitoring their activities via radio and providing them information to ensure their safety and whereas public safety telecommunicators of Carroll County have contributed substantially to the apprehension of criminals, suppression of fires, and treatment of patients. Of patients. Now, therefore, we, the Board of Carroll County Commissioners, do hereby proclaim April 9th, 2023 through April 15th, 2023 as Public Safety Telecommunicators Week in Carroll County in honor of the dedicated women and men whose diligence and professionalism keeps our county and citizens safe adopted the sixth day of April 2023 by the Board of Carroll County Commissioners. Okay, there's a whole lot of whereas's, but a lot of purpose associated with the proclamation. Who would like to uh, share with us some insight? Ms. Val, you wanna start it off? And it's not gonna be like everyone, is it? No, it'll just be me, I believe. Speaking, is, Speaking. if that's what okay. you're, okay. No, I just wanted to say thank you, take the opportunity to say thank you. We truly appreciate the commissioners taking the time to recognize these folks. They're not all here, obviously, uh, but we do have some of the, the telecommunicators that work in our county here today. They are uh, very dedicated. They care deeply about what they do, and it means the world that you have taken the time to recognize all of their efforts to help keep the community safe. Absolutely. They could be very thankless. So and very, very important. It's a very, so. very difficult job and they do it well. They do, so thank you. Any uh, comments? I just very briefly, thank you for what you do and God bless you for doing it. Yes, so. thank, thank you. you. Oh. Okay, why don't we, uh, you wanna do a photo opportunity? Everybody involved, come on up. Everybody up. It might be best to do it. What we can do is one stay in front and we'll be in the back and Rose is in the middle. Thank you. thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. thank you. Okay. <clears throat> we have another proclamation dealing with the National Child Abuse Prevention Month. And Commissioner Garin, I believe you have. Sorry, appreciate that. Was stalling a little bit because I needed some help with acronyms because I think it's important to recognize everybody here because we've got a lot of people here for this proclamation. Absolutely. So um, again, uh, if you're watching on TV, we've got a very strong presence from the Carroll County Sheriff's Office, the State's Attorney's Office. I think the Westminster Police Department is here as well. Uh, Springboard, the uh, Child Protective Services, uh, the Department of Health, and Carrie, Carrie Dell from Great crisis, uh, I think, is, uh, thank you for joining us. Everybody, thank you for joining us this morning for this proclamation. Uh, the proclamation is in honor of National Child Abuse Prevention Month to bring awareness to child, National Child Abuse Prevention Month with this April 2023. So I will read the proclamation. Whereas children are essential to Carroll County's success and quality of life for its citizens, children are a precious and valuable resource, as well as our most valuable citizens. Children have a right to be safe and have a right to the opportunity to thrive, learn, and grow in an environment that fosters healthy development. And whereas children are the future parents, employees, leader of our county, 
adults have the responsibility to encourage and nurture children's growth and development. And whereas protecting children from poverty, community and family violence, social isolation and bullying is a responsibility we all share, and whereas child abuse prevention depends on partnerships among social service agencies, child advocacy centers, schools, religious institutions, all levels of government, the business community and law enforcement agencies, and whereas providing a safe nurturing environment for our children helps ensure that Carol's children grow to their full potential as the next generation of leaders helping to secure the future of the city, county, state, and nation. Now therefore, the Board of Carroll County Commissioners do hereby proclaim April 2023 as National Child Abuse Prevention Month. Month. We urge all citizens to recognize this month by dedicating ourselves to the task of improving the quality of life for all children and families. Adopted this day, the sixth day of April 2023, the Board of Carroll County Commissioners. Okay. Um, very well said, and I think the uh, only comment I can make is by looking out to you collectively, um, along with those that are watching, they say it takes a village, you know, and uh, um, it sure does. With all the garbage that happens and uh, challenges that we have in our community, um, it's unfortunate that we have those challenges, but we are so blessed to have a community dedicated to uh, working together and um, minimizing this uh, from all those that Commissioner Garen mentioned. Um, so with that, does anybody want to share? And then I'll ask anybody from the community that wants to get up. But just very briefly, like before, thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you do, and God bless you for doing it. Okay. Yes, um, thank you all, and it's it's uh, it's so nice to see all the chairs full on a very very positive thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Who wants to talk? Hello, Nicole Jackman, Senior Director for Springboard. Uh, I just want to take a second to thank everybody who's present in the chairs and the commissioner. Uh, the Child Advocacy Center is a true representation of Carroll County, where all partners are working together, whether it's Springboard Rape Crisis, uh, Sheriff's Office, Westminster City Police, Department of Social Services. You are right. It does take a village not only to raise but heal those impacted by, ch by child abuse. So I appreciate the recognition and everyone in the audience. Very well said as one team. Who else? Mr. Shoemaker, you don't want to share anything? Now that I pointed you out, you got to get up and say something. <laughs> <laughs> I learned a long time ago that a microphone is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> it, it truly is a, uh, a collaborative effort that we have in Carroll County. Uh, you know, I'm I'm privileged to uh, sit on the board of Sakaic. Uh, we have a board meeting coming up next week, I think, as a matter of fact. Uh, Seth Giller, who heads up our Special Victims Unit, is here with us. Mike Stewart, who you all know, is here with us. Uh, but yeah, it it is a great partnership that we have with all of the uh, players who are represented in this room uh, to try to end the scourge of child abuse. So thank you all for the recognition. Absolutely. Thank you. Anyone else? I see the Colonel back there. Uh, it's hard to miss. So uh, you have anything you want to share? <clears throat> we, I'm very proud of our Call her a microphone, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, thank you very much for the proclamation. It's awesome. Our detectives at Sakaic, it, what they see and do every day is incredible. I was a commander of SADI for a long time. and. You folks put your heart and souls into these cases, and they're tough. They're tough. And thanks, everybody, for what you do and how we all work together. No, thank you so much. Okay, I'm not going to be picking and choosing others. Um, <laughs> why don't we do a, a happy snap? This could be a, a fun one, getting everybody in front of us, and we will sit in the back. So please, everyone involved. <laughs> no problem. 
<laughs> I wish I'd known. Uh, okay. I'll be back. I'll stay in the back of the house. Thank you. 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 <laughs> okay, yeah, I didn't do anything. As long as, long as you can see the camera, it's going to be good. As long as you can see the people in front of us, that's yeah. all that matters. Just going to click, everybody, please don't blink. That's always, yes. there's always one. Oh, now Matt. Wait, 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 wait. Oh. Can you tell us again, Jess? Yeah. Okay. And Matt? Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Oh, no, don't knock me off. <laughs> <laughs> Who keeps that? That goes somewhere. Oh, nice to see you. I don't want to be responsible Okay. Way to clear a room, Celine. I know. What'd you do? <laughs> What'd she say? I don't know. <laughs> she got right up there. That's okay. That's okay. Good morning to all of you. Okay, Good let's talk about the consideration Carroll County Bureau of Housing Streamlined Annual Plan for Fiscal Year 2023. Okay, so we, we had come before you, Commissioners. Um, I'm joined here, let me start there, Celine Steckel, the Director of Citizen Services. I'm joined by Danielle Yates, our Bureau Chief of Housing and Community Connections, and then Paul Moffitt, who is our Housing Manager. And we had come before you back in February on the 16th to lay out the different changes that we're making to our housing annual plan. Um, and this is for our Housing Choice Voucher Program. Um, but part of HUD's regulations require us to then put this out, um, to the public and advertise it publicly and then bring it back for a public hearing uh, within 45 days of people having a chance to review our changes. So we have done that. It's been publicly available for people to review um, and now we need to host a public hearing to see if there are any comments. And Tim, I believe you'll start the public hearing process for us. Good morning, Commissioners. I would just note that uh, this uh, hearing was advertised in the Carroll County Times on March 1st, 2023 and March 15th, 2023. Uh, does staff have anything else they would like to add before we open it up to the public? So um, just to give notice to our resident advisory board also met on March 15th where they reviewed all changes and they support all five adjustments that we have um, proposed to our administrative plan. To date, we have had no comments or inquiries regarding the proposed changes as well. Would there be any other questions that we can answer for you? In, in total, how many vouchers are there with this program? 796. 790, yeah. I'm sorry? 796. Is that um, in comparison to 2022 uh, an increase? Is it, I mean, it's by demand. It's by, you know. So, of course, we always have to wait until HUD would put out a public notice right. and give us the right to apply. But since we came before you last time, there have been um, increases due to the additional funding with COVID. Um, we are up to 119 mainstream vouchers. We have 33 family unification program vouchers. They are the two areas where we were allowed to apply and receive <coughs> additional vouchers. Mm -hmm. um, all others remain the same. We have 100 non-elderly -elder disabled vouchers, 15 VASH or veteran assistance supportive housing vouchers, and the rest are what we call just regular housing choice vouchers, which is 524. We did just add five. 529, yes. We got five additional vouchers there as well through COVID. Are the veteran affairs, are the veteran vouchers all used? Yes, they are. 
we work remember we have to work with our VA right in, down in Baltimore right. um, we actually meet monthly to go over the cases make sure that there's no assistance we can provide and make sure that all the vouchers are being utilized okay. And the one thing with those vouchers, we recently met with the VA to talk with them about um, the intensive case management that's, that goes along with those vouchers. And recently in the meeting, we talked about having other part of this plan is having other move on strategy vouchers for folks on a VASH voucher that are, are more um, independent at this point and don't need that intensive case management and moving those folks on into a regular voucher so then that will open another VASH voucher for, for individuals right. um, that are veterans. And, and the, the VASH vouchers are important because the restrictions on some of the past barriers that may have prevented someone get to getting a housing choice voucher are not quite as strict with a, a VASH voucher. So that's very important. Okay. Any uh, comments from up here? Is there any public comment out in the audience for this? Is there anyone on the phone? No one on the line. Okay. Um, there's no reason just to close and not approve. We could just close and approve at this point, correct? is what you would be recommending yes yeah, so what you're you're approving is submitting that the plan as drafted to to uh, hud for their final uh -huh. approval yep okay <clears throat> motion to close the public hearing and approve the plan be submitted to hud second. second i got a motion i got a couple of seconds no discussion all in favor all right Aye. thank you thank, thank you. you thanks for thank all you. your work let's talk about the westminster annexation Number 75, Stone Chapel, LLC. Ladies. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're back before you again to uh, work with you on the annexation for the city of Westminster. Um, Hannah just has a couple slides to refresh your memory on, on what we discussed last week. We did have a great meeting yesterday with the city and our Department of Public Works, and I believe the issue in which you were concerned about with the comment letter is resolved and everyone feels comfortable to move forward with this annexation. So with that, I'm going to have Hannah Weber um, just go over with you a couple slides. When you said a great meeting, would you actually say not a great meeting if you're meeting Perhaps, with Perhaps, if Malcolm? it wasn't a great meeting, <laughs> I don't just, know. Just Let's asking. not have a bad meeting and we'll find out. <laughs> okay. I was at the meeting. It wasn't that great. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's not as great as your tie. Thank you. That's an awesome tie. <laughs> Go ahead, okay. Anna. Good morning, everybody. Um, Good morning. As Linda said, I just have a couple slides to refresh your memory. And then um, Doug Brown is here from the Department of Public Works to kind of give their um, further comments on the meeting yesterday and how they feel um, regarding the meeting yesterday. Um, so after the meeting, we were sent this amended plat for the annexation. If you'll remember, the main uh, concerns from the Department of Public Works were regarding the right-of-way on Stone Chapel Road and Avondale Road. The petitioners have submitted, submitted this amended annexation plat to remove the Stone Chapel Road piece, so it um, does not encompass Stone Chapel Road anymore. It stops at the property line. And then also on Avondale Road, the annexation area does not encompass Avondale Road any longer. It stops, again, at the property line. And um, after the meeting, it was disclosed by Doug Brown that they are in support of this annexation with the inclusion of the amended plot by the petitioners. And if Doug Brown wants to speak any more to that. She's absolutely correct, commissioners. The amended uh, plat addresses all the concerns that the Department of Public Works has, and we could support this request. The maintenance of the roads, no issues. No issues, sir. We already work uh, with Westminster uh, here and there in other small areas. Obviously, uh, it is in most cases dependent upon how much surface area that we have to maintain because it doesn't make much sense for anyone, whether it a city, town, or county, to go out and do you know one small piece of a road and then we go do the other. It's just simply not practical nor cost effective. So no issues there, sir. Any? Uh questions concerns issues well, thank you very much for following up on this and knowing that that you guys are okay with this makes me feel comfortable with it so and it was a good meeting <laughs> <laughs> not, not a great meeting well you know it, honestly you go to a lot of meetings as do we and it was very productive in fact we all commented on these particular issues FaceTime versus email is often the best way to get 
these types of issues addressed very quickly, yep. and it worked. Fantastic. Okay. I move that the board approve, sign, and forward the comment letter to the City of Westminster regarding Westminster Annexation Number 75, Stone Chapel, LLC. Second. I got a motion. You got a second. Any discussion on this? Seeing here, none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Okay. Thank you. Have Thank a great you. afternoon. Thank you all very much. Very much. Let's talk about 2022 Carroll County Hazard Mitigation Plan. Morning. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Um, good morning again, commissioners. Um, morning. We are here this morning to provide an informational briefing on the 2022 Carroll County Hazard Mitigation Plan. Um, we have just a few slides, definitely not a, a huge number of them, but just to try to help keep us all on track. Uh, as we go through this information. Uh, I realize that most of you probably don't deal with mitigation quite often in your day-to-day -day lives, so I uh, want to make sure we provide you with the most concise information we can on a very large plan. So mitigation is one of the phases of the emergency management cycle. So it's you know prevention, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. And that's what we do on a regular basis to make sure that we're uh, meeting our goal of reducing or eliminating the probability of a disaster ever occurring if we can or minimizing the effects uh, or dissipate dissipate the effects of disasters once they do occur <clears throat> um, so just like we have the emergency operations plan to guide us when emergencies are actually occurring we have the hazard mitigation plan that's intended to serve as a guide uh, for implementation of hazard mitigation projects and initiatives within Carroll County so that we can take those actions to keep our community safer before a disaster might ever occur. Um, there's multiple benefits to having this plan. Um, we are trying to save lives and property by reducing vulnerability. Um, one of the big reasons that uh, a community does a hazard mitigation plan is we, it does provide us eligibility to apply for federal hazard mitigation funding. Uh, there's multiple grant programs that are out there, the hazard mitigation grant program, uh, the building resilient infrastructure and communities program. You probably have heard that referred to as the BRIC program. Uh, federal uh, flood mitigation assistance. Um, this also keeps us eligible for permanent work uh, for public assistance declarations. So a public assistance declaration is what we might get after a disaster happens, uh, but having a hazard mitigation plan that's approved by FEMA is a requirement for us to be eligible for uh, permanent work. So things like rebuilding bridges, rebuilding infrastructure, that type of thing. Um, most of the programs for hazard mitigation funding have a 25% match requirement. So, um, Another benefit to the county is that it saves us money. The cost of mitigation is normally much less than the cost uh, of recovery. Um, the analysis by the National Institute of Building Sciences recently indicates that uh, $6 saved on average for every one dollar spent in mitigation efforts uh, the number used to be uh, four dollars uh, to one um, the most recent study has actually shown that it's even more effective than that so as part of the planning process to develop the plan um, we identified the hazards that were most likely to affect Carroll County uh, this plan does not include every single hazard that Carroll County might be subject to uh, but they are the ones that are most likely for our uh, jurisdiction. Um, and it also does not uh, address anything other than natural hazards. FEMA only requires us for hazard mitigation planning to address natural hazards. Um, so in this plan, we've addressed drought, flooding, thunderstorms and wind, tornadoes, winter storms, soil movement, and dam failure. And um, we worked uh, to uh, identify some proposed mitigation strategies to the risks that were identified from those uh, particular hazards. A um, little bit about the planning process. Uh, we do this, uh, the, in a perfect world, we do this every five years. Um, for this particular plan, we actually started the planning process uh, right before the pandemic kicked off. Uh, that uh, pandemic response slowed us down significantly. Uh, as uh, you know, emergency management is very involved in the response to the pandemic. Um, we only have so many resources to go around, so 
uh, this uh, had to be slightly deprioritized to deal with the pandemic response. But we got back to it and we have uh, accomplished it. Um, we're not the only uh, stakeholder here. Uh, we, are the, we serve as the lead planning agency, uh, but there are many other stakeholders involved, including uh, plant, Department of Planning, Department of Land and Resource Management, the Department of Public Works. Um, also, all eight of the Carroll County municipalities were uh, planning stakeholders, so they are participants in this plan. The, um, <clears throat> that last slide, the, the public outreach. Mm -hmm. When, I mean, I see where it occurs in the cycle. <coughs> yes. Has that occurred or when yes. will it? Uh, it occurs uh, throughout the planning process. Um, we did a, uh, we actually had a really good response to uh, an online survey because we were doing this through the midst of the pandemic. Uh, we needed to do it in a virtual format. Uh, we put a, a um, survey out there asking folks what hazards they felt their community was most uh, vulnerable to, uh, some su uh, suggested actions that they thought might help to mitigate some of the issues. Uh, a total of 54 individuals participated in that survey, which is extraordinarily high. I mean, we had the fact that people were doing things mostly virtually to help us, but it was a really good, uh, a really good response. Um, they identified severe storms and wind, flooding and winter storms as the hazards affecting their areas most frequently. Um, so 30 mentions for severe storms and wind, 17 for flooding, and 16 for winter storms. So we had that opportunity for public uh, involvement. We also, uh, throughout the planning process, utilized our local emergency planning committee, or LEPC. Uh, that has uh, members of the public, members of uh, hazardous materials uh, facilities, uh, so all sorts, of, uh, kind of a cross section of the county. Uh, they were had the opportunity to be involved in the in the planning process as well. So we definitely have public uh, involvement in it. And when we talk about the updating it annually on a five year cycle, um, there is also opportunity for you know for public involvement throughout that update process. Every year, um, we have an opportunity to to look at the plan, see if anything's changed, uh, and do a little bit of an update. So, so uh, apologies, oh, I'm no, please. I'm Please. Certainly, Commissioner, go ahead. No, no, I can ask when you're done. I apologize. Okay. Um, so, as required by FEMA regula regulation, uh, we submitted our plan, our initial draft, to the Maryland Department of Emergency Management and FEMA for review in mid October of 2022. Uh, FEMA sent back required revisions to the plan, which is not unusual. That's very, uh, very, very usual. Uh, uh, we accomplished those revisions. Uh, we resubmitted the revised plan in late February of 2023, and we received notification on the 15th of March that the plan is now granted approvable pending adoption status. Um, and what that means is FEMA has looked at the plan, they have said that we meet all of the planning requirements to their satisfaction, and they have issued us a letter that says, as long as your board of commissioners uh, or other governing body formally adopts it, then it's finally completely approved and you can move forward and you are eligible for all of the benefits that go along with having an approved plan. Um, so uh, this month, this week's uh, opportunity to speak to you is simply an information session, an opportunity to, for you to ask questions, for us to provide uh, these uh, uh, details about the plan. Um, and then next week we're scheduled to appear before you again to ask you to formally adopt the plan. And then once that hopefully takes place um, we will submit that uh, resolution uh, to FEMA once they have that we'll be good to go for another five years um, one thing I do want to mention is that uh, each municipality because they have participated in the planning process they are also eligible to participate in the plan as long as each governing body of each municipality also formally adopts the plan through whatever process is specific to that municipality Okay. So any questions for us? Thank you. So then this is more, I guess, out of curiosity, uh, more so than anything else as it relates to the, the mitigation plan. And if you do not have the information with you today, that's all right. So how many dams are there in the county? And how does one separate a natural hazard affecting a dam from, say, you know, a man-made hazard from affecting a dam. Because, for example, if you have a dam that fails in the midst of a bad storm, obviously that's attributable to a natural circumstance. But if, uh, you know, like a week later the dam fails but the water level is lower, 
is that still attributable to the natural disaster? Does it have to do with the construction design of the dam, or, or how does that? <laughs> a little complicated, I know. Uh, so I believe, um, and I'm working from memory here, I believe that there are 11 significant or high hazard dams in the county. There are many more that are considered low hazard, um, and the definition of a dam is something that Land and Resource Management and Director Hine would be able to provide you in much more detail uh, than, than I. Um, with regard to delineating whether a dam failure is a natural hazard or not, that really uh, falls back to uh, the engineers to determine, you know, for in your example, if we have a storm uh, and then a week later uh, a dam fails. It could be because there's an intrinsic issue with the dam and the, the, the storm a week ago weakened it or something along that line. So that's really something that the, that the engineering staff that uh, work on dams on a, a regular basis would need to determine. But it could be, it could be either one. It could oh. be natural, it could be right. non-natural. That, that definitely makes sense. And I was just curious about that because on that list, I mean, that, that's the only thing that really is man-made on there you know we're not running around uh you know causing winter storms or, or whatever the case is so no yeah. no nope. nope. i definitely would not would not do that having spent many many hours in an eoc for winter storm response i would not do them create them on purpose <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much mm -hmm. thank you commissioner anything else i mean there is the heat miser and snow miser but that, that's right that's so. right um what about uh you're feeding into FEMA, and the Maryland Department of Emergency, that, that's MEMA now, so. Well, MEMA was, MEMA is now MDEM. Oh, MEMA is now MDEM. Correct. M MDEM. So you're submitting it to MDEM as, and separately into FEMA, or? It's a joint effort it's with MDEM okay. and FEMA. Okay. So uh, we submit it, technically we submit it to MDEM and FEMA at the same time. Okay. MDEM looks at it first and says, okay, we think that it's, that the plan's Got in good it. shape and they transmit it on to okay. FEMA on our behalf. Um, and yeah, I appreciate it. And just <clears throat> for good the community mm -hmm. recently, over the last couple of years, MEMA turned into a cabinet level and was brought up to a cabinet level called MDEM. So Correct. I thought it was vice versa, but okay. Sounds good. Um, any comments on this for information? Okay, thank All you right. so much. Thank, thank you. you very thank much. Thank you for the opportunity. We will see Absolutely. you next week. Yep. Mr. Deggetts, let's talk about Cape Horn Park field lighting. Mr. Degas, what is the design on your tie? Because I think you're in competition now with Mr. Burke. <laughs> I, I think Mr. Burke wins, but <laughs> I, I, I'd have to be a close second. <laughs> Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Good morning. The Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Department of Recreation and Parks, requests your approval to award Baltimore Gas and Electric, a sole source vendor, to work to install electric at Cape Horn Park for field lighting in the amount of $40,990. This amount is within the FY23 budget, so no additional funds should be necessary. And I'll turn it over to Jeff to talk about the project. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. You may recall a little while back, we uh, brought to you the bids for approval to purchase the lighting and the light standards for Cape Horn Park. This is the part of the project that actually brings power to the site that will support the lights. So BGE, as Maureen said, is the sole provider of that. And uh, we are very much looking forward to getting them started so then the rest of the project can proceed. Is there a timeline associated? We're looking at this year. It's going to depend on uh, the lead time for the poles and equipment. That is all in the works now okay but obviously they can't start it with any of the site work until they get power to the site okay any questions motion to approve the installation of electric for field lighting at cape horn park to baltimore gas and electric in the amount of forty thousand nine hundred ninety dollars got a motion i got a second any discussion on this all in favor aye, aye. aye. thank you thank you thank, thank you, you. And yes, thank you for this. <laughs> okay, Colonel, why don't you come on up? Let's talk about 
purchase of mobile data terminals and related equipment. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Is that a double whammy here? Okay. <laughs> The Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Carroll County Sheriff's Office and the County's Department of Technology Services, is requesting your approval to award the purchase of mobile data terminals and related equipment to Brooks Network Services at a cost of $737,080.95. TD6 6X was awarded. <laughs> A competitively bid contract by the National Cooperative Purchasing Alliance, uh, which Brooks Network Services LLC is an authorized dealer. This amount is within the FY23 budget, so no additional funds should be required. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. So, um, as I mentioned last week, this is yet another piece of our overall um, camera project. Um, these devices go in our patrol vehicles and they connect to vehicle docks. So as we work towards basically upgrading, upgrading all the equipment technology in the vehicles, this is another component of that. So <clears throat> it has the uh, newest technology to be able to handle all the data, the video back and forth from the in-car cameras, etc. So what we're looking to do is transitioning to having all of the same technology in the vehicles on the same platform. They all integrate and work together and rather than piecemealing piece by piece year after year and running into issues when then things don't like to talk to each other down the road. So, and if there's any other questions? Again, getting a schematic of the system of systems. Correct, when we get Really yes. help yes. from the analysts um, to the different pieces of equipment, yes. um, <clears throat> I think would educate us, but also educate the community that mm -hmm. this is not just, you know, pieces, right. but it's an, an umbrella or a system of systems. So, okay. Okay. Motion to approve the purchase of computers to Brooks Network Services, LLC, in the amount of $737,080.95. Second. I have a motion, I have a second. Any discussion on this? Seen here, none all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, let's talk about some repair over at Critters Court. Good morning. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. The Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Bureau of Utilities, requests your approval to award a contract for the pavement repair of the Curtis Court water line replacement trench to HDI contractors in the amount of $26,500. This award will be made via a competitively bid term contract. Bids were solicited from four contractors and proposals were received from three of these contractors. The bid amount is within the adopted budget and no additional funds should be necessary. And I'll let Andy explain the project mm -hmm. to you. Gentlemen, for the four new members on, on, on the board, uh, the previous board awarded the construction, the, 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 the replacement of water laterals and service lines uh, for Curtis Court, Court in August of last year. So the, the, the uh, water uh, mains have been uh, replaced, the laterals have been replaced. We let the trench sit over the winter for settlement purposes. This project now, th th this item is for the final paving of, of Curtis Court with the settlement in place. So it's, it's the last part of the overall process. And Curtis Court's off of Sunset down Eldersburg on the east side of Eldersburg. So just, it's not the biggest road, but it's, um, you know, just let you know where it is. So, um, I'll move the Board of Commissioners award a contract for the pavement repair of the Curtis Court water line replacement trench to HGI contractors in the amount of $26,500. Second. I got a motion, got a second. Any discussion? I have a general, I just have a general question. Mm -hmm. These types of projects, what, what's the, what's the genesis of a lot of them? I mean, in other words, what, what triggers a lot of these projects? Is it somebody, a, a resident of a street starts uh, making uh, inquiries to the county is this a continuous process where you're just having people going out and, mm -hmm. 
you know, uh, inspecting these roads on a regular basis? Is it just a matter of, well, it's been 20 years, we probably need to take a look at this? I mean, can you just help me understand sure. how these get to this point? Absolutely. It, it, it's basically two, two different types of processes. One is we, we, we continually monitor the age of our system. So Curtis Court was one of the older roads as far as the, the water service laterals go. We, we also have an extensive work order system. Uh, we, we, we had a history of, of, uh, of uh, water lateral uh, breakages and failures on Curtis Court. So, so this was a combination of both of those, the age of the overall system for that roadway, as well as a series of complaints okay. or, or breaks. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Any other uh, discussion? Good, good question. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Okay, it's time to talk about Delta Task Order Number 7 for the Supplemental Environmental Assessment Services that are requested by FAA. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. <clears throat> Sit alone, unafraid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here this morning, as you said, to request your approval on Delta. Uh, airport consultants task order number seven to provide additional supplemental environmental assessment services as requested by the FAA. The supplemental environmental assessment will be studying the bog turtle, the northern long-eared bat, and the Indiana bat. Total cost of the task order is $260,000. The work will be reimbursed by the FAA who will pay 90% or $234,000 and the county will pay 10% or $26,000 out of the airport enterprise fund. And if I may, before I open up for questions, um, we, we got a chance to, well, first I want to thank two citizens for, the, for their uh, amazing help in uh, helping us uh, research a little more on the, on the uh, bald eagle. Lindsay Fabiano was a woman that gave us uh, an email and came in and, and um, spoke at the public hearing. She put me in touch with a gentleman named Paul Moreno who took time out of his busy schedule and away from his family to meet me out there and hike out through the woods and show me where the nest is located. Um, so I want to thank those two for their, their help. Uh, I, have, I have since taken the coordinates of the nest and pictures of the nest and we've sent it on to Fish and Wildlife for their assessment. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. I'm hearing more about bald eagles lately. Like, you know, friends and <coughs> having sightings of bald eagles I mean are we getting just more and more bald eagles in the community uh, which is really cool mm -hmm. because they're amazing you know uh, birds it's just you they know, know they, they know, know we're I'm just they, curious they, well they know that we're, we're a pro-american patriotic kind <laughs> of <laughs> <it is>. yeah. <laughs> there, no but you, you're correct there are more sightings we actually uh, my parents had uh, several actually outside of Manchester the other month yeah. So we are, we are seeing more. I don't know why, but it's right. it's interesting. I, um, I couldn't tell you what a long-eared bat looks like, except it probably has some long ears. But Very long or ears. an Indiana bat compared to an Ohio bat, but that's all right. Um, we're making the amount for two hundred sixty thousand. That's in total, as opposed to the twenty six thousand. That's our responsibility. Is that Yes, so the task orders in the, in the amount of 260000 um, 234 will, will be reimbursed by the FAA. Okay. And the twenty six will be uh, our responsibility. It will come out of the airport enterprise fund. Okay. Okay. Motion to approve Delta Task Order Number 7 for the Supplemental Environmental Assessment Services in the amount of $260,000. Second. That motion got a second. Any discussion? I, I know I know I'm not the only person sitting up here who thinks two hundred and sixty thousand dollars to study a turtle, a bat. So it is two four bats. acres two of bats. four two acres. Bats. Two bats. I stand four corrected. acres. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's roughly uh, four acres wow. of bog turtle trappings and 150 acres of bat study. I know. I know I'm, I'm just and and just to just to put your mind at ease, um, there is a process with the FAA uh, that we have to get an independent fee estimate from another firm to confirm Delta's proposal. Uh, their their independent fee estimate came in ninety one thousand five hundred dollars over what Delta has proposed. We've talked to Delta. Delta is fine with their fee, so 
again, I, and I appreciate it. I'm just sort of thinking out loud. Uh, but uh, appreciate your appreciate your efforts on this as well. So thanks, Eric. I'll do it for half that much. <laughs> I, I was about to say maybe well, you maybe go hiking. Hey. Only if you go hiking in your South Park time. <laughs> I think you take him up on that right now. <laughs> well, can you identify now, the Indiana we'll, back? We'll probably have to. We'll probably have to find somebody to sit there because you'll be busy. But I think <clears> we can sacrifice. Long eared bat to sit here. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing the Indiana bat has got to be pretty easy to identify. He's flying around with Indiana State flags. I don't know what the Indiana State uh, flag right? looks like. <laughs> so, um, He's got a little, little flag okay. tattooed on him. Right. You know, uh, it's, I'm sorry, I, di I digress. No, you, you didn't, no, that's di right. you didn't so, digress because... I'm ready to Mr. vote. Gern, I think you should make the motion. No, it's already been made. <laughs> made. We, we got the motion oh. made and seconded. And... Uh, any other discussion on this one? All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. You see that? I did. Okay. I did. <laughs> okay, now let's talk about task order number eight for the final phase of land acquisition services. Yes, Commissioner, so this is exactly what it says. It's the final phase of our land acquisition for the airport. Uh, as you're well aware, the, the land that we're acquiring around the airport for, to, uh, for the project to move forward. Um, the task order is a total of 206,000. Um, the scope of work will be reimbursed by the FAA, who will pay 90% of this task order as well, or 185,400, and the county will pay 10% of the task order, which is 20,600, out of the airport enterprise fund. Okay. <clears throat> um, the it's it's a complex you know issue with um the airport and there's a lot of moving pieces <clears throat> um kind of kind of like the you know sheriff's department with the cameras you know it's a system of systems i feel like this is a yes. a system of systems when it comes to the airport and it's hard to kind of put it all into one kind of picture um and you do a great job in trying to get us there um Thank you. <clears throat> but it's, you know, it's, it's I want to say it, it feels like sometimes I'm piecemealed, you know, now I'm looking at bats and turtles and now I'm looking at this and, you know, and then we're looking at roads and stuff like that. So um, I think maybe, and it's, it's not like it's, you know, today, but here are the actions that have taken place in dealing with the airport and dealing with the uh the requirements that have you know been put upon us to upgrade the airport's you know safety and you know the the target that we're going after and here are the things that we still have to accomplish um i know would help me in my expectations of what is going to be coming in front of me because uh <clears throat> you know um understanding the reason about bats and turtles i got that but my expectation isn't that it, that was going to be coming in front of me. Um, does that make sense? Uh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I can. I, I will certainly. Uh, that, that's a simple task. Yeah. I can. I can show you where we've been and, and yeah. where we need to go. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll be coming in front of you for. So as you might understand, the, there's only so much money the FAA uh, dedicates to this project every year. So that's why it does seem piecemeal. Yeah. Um, so we'll be coming to you between now and 2032, 33 before this project is final. Uh, finally constructed and done with so um, absolutely I can give you I can give you the past and what, yeah. what we're looking to do in the future no problem at all okay yeah I think that would be honestly a good information um, brief for us or you know at least for me I know and then also for the community so um, okay um, I'll move the Board of County Commissioner approved Delta task order number eight for the final phase of land acquisition services in amount $206,000. Second. I have a motion, I have a second. Any discussion on this? Not discussion, but I just want to make one comment if I could. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Bokey and Mr. Burdine and everybody involved in this. I know this has a, been a very complex, as to Commissioner Rothstein's point, you know, piecemeal in some aspects of how we're seeing it, but I know there's a lot of moving parts, and I just want to say to all of you, I greatly appreciate all the hard work and time you've all put into this. I know it's been a long, ongoing process, so just thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. So, 
Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Okay. I think we're about five days or four days left to sign a die down in Annapolis. And with that said, Mr. Fowler is going to tell us all the great news that's coming to Carroll Thank County. You, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm lighthearted. See what I can do to change the mood. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Well, just by giving us a piece of paper kind of puts the damper on it. So, go well, ahead. So, understanding that, I mean, do we refer this to Mr. Burke about whether or not this is a great meeting? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, five days left, uh, down to crunch time. Still a lot, a lot of things unsettled. Most of the things on this briefing sheet are not yet finalized. Um, the first thing I want to do is uh, mea culpa on the budget. Uh, last week I said to you that Carroll County was left out of the budget. I uh, spoke too soon. <laughs> uh, two projects that are that were in the in the budget explicitly were 250,000 for the Hampstead Volunteer Fire Department and 50,000 for the Arc of Carroll County. <clears throat> There's a, a placeholder for 2.5 million for statewide for playgrounds, playgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, and but the legislative bond initiatives had, have not been identified and voted on yet. I just got word from Senator Reedy's office that may not actually be until Monday, uh, signy die. So uh, we'll we'll know better if there are any other items coming through on that, and then we'll know the specifics <clears throat> on the playground money. Uh, of course, our facilities bond is um, obviously that, that passed, as it always does. The cannabis bill is, is still in flux. Uh, there are differences between the House and the Senate version. Um, the, the Senate has changed the tax structure. You'll remember it's 1.5% in the House version of what's collected in the county. And that would go to the county and the municipality. Senate version says 5% of taxes collected in the county go to the county, and then the county should share that with any municipality that has, uh, I suppose, that has a dispensary. And so we'll see how that gets ironed out in, in conference. Uh, the, again, the zoning issue is left intact. So I suspect that's that's another one that's going to come down to Monday, but it is a it is a, a priority and it it will pass in some form. The governor got his uh, minimum wage bill passed again. The indexing was taken out of that, so this simply just accelerates the minimum wage uh, to um, October of of this year. The constant yield bill. Uh, that looks like that's going to go through. Uh, the Class 4 limited winery license bill, that has some differences in the House and the Senate version. Uh, looks like the both of them have struck that gross receipts language. The Senate says the winery has to get a Class B beer and wine license. The House says either a Class B or D. Um, but those bills have bathed both chambers, and now they're back in their original committees to be cleaned up. Uh, the forest conservation bill is going to pass. That one was held up, didn't go through uh, by crossover, but it was a priority. So, so it looked likely that that will pass. Uh, I think everybody in the counties are comfortable now with where that is. Uh, Senate Bill 49 and House Bill 692, the, the CPCN and local permits, this one was problematic when it when it was uh, submitted because it was an attempt to try to make sure that a county would uh, would in in reasonable time would process any local permits after a CPCN was issued for a solar generation project. Um, the understanding is Dorchester sat on a permit for a lengthy period of time, so the developers were in there, the advocates were, were in to try to clean that up. The problem was the language said that she'll process the permit. 
which was problematic because it, it could be interpreted to leave what little uh, mitigation ability you have on these installations. So screening, setbacks, those kinds of things. So uh, MAKO was successful in getting both the Senate and the House to agree that the language will be approve or deny local permits. Uh, so we, we do retain that. There was a little bit of panic late last week or late this week. Um, but uh, that's that's been resolved. Uh, the Senate Bill 613 and 908 that that remains as it is. The House version is uh, is ready for final passage in the Senate, so it looks like that one will go through. Uh, that will gives the ability, the opportunity, I guess, is, is the word to increase um, where you have adjacent parcels. Right now, two, mil, uh, two megawatts is the limit for community solar. If you have it on adjacent parcels, it can go up to five megawatts. And then eventually that, will, that limit will only be uh, whatever the utility can accept onto the system through the net metering system. <clears throat> Still no, no final on our House Bill 119, the, the curriculum guides. Uh, but as we suspect, the Senate will just sit on that through sine die. Uh, collective bargaining for public libraries, it looks like that may not pass. Uh, that's House Bill 65, missed that on the, on the sheet, but uh, this was the one where we wanted to make sure that you would have the ability to, uh, to I guess, send back any agreement made between the union and the library based on funding uh, obligation. So that probably won't pass, but it will be back, I'm sure. And so MAKO will have the opportunity to represent us and try to make sure that that stays in any new bill. Mike, what was the, the call number given to it again? Uh, House Bill 65. Thank you. Uh, down to the, the blueprint salary grant. So you'll remember that one got uh, got all twisted up and amended uh, it it now looks like it it will likely pass uh, it mandates one 150k salary for blueprint coordinator for fiscal year 25 and 26 it does split the cost at the formula a foundation formula rate between the state and the county the city gets a 10 million dollar uh, decrease in their local share and Kent County gets a grant as well. Uh, they fit a very narrow description um, in the bill. Uh, it does require the State Board of Ed to, or excuse me, the, yes, the State Board of Ed to file and in, get an independent uh, report to the General Assembly on progress of the blueprint across the state. So, uh, Mr. Burke, do you want the $150,000 salary or do you want to go count bats and turtles? <laughs> You know, just these, these options seem to be like continuing to to uh, be out there for just spend more money. So just just throwing it out there. And just to clarify, Mike, that would that that one hundred and fifty thousand dollars salary that's that's on us to pay the county. Uh, it's split between the state and the county based on the foundation formula. So I think that's a seventy thirty split. So you'll be on for I think the seventy. And it's not clear, um, not everybody has hired someone to be just right. that, that role. So right now it's John O'Neill and, right. and there's another individual, I think, that's performing that function. I think there's two, it's John and somebody else. Yeah. There, are, there are two. Splitting right. that responsibility. Yep. Right. Yes. So there's no real specificity in here about how that gets done. So it's. It's still vague, but I'm sure they'll figure it out. Let's see. The burden of proof. So this was a bill that right now when, uh, when a parent protests an, uh, an individual education plan for their child, um, the parent bears the burden of proof that that's not appropriate for the child. 
this bill would turn that around and the school would bear the burden of the proof. And uh, th there's thought that that is likely to pass. There seems to be an awful lot that is sort of in, in limbo right now. And maybe that's not the, the best word to use, but uh, still, there's still some work to be done between both chambers to get these bills moved. Uh, election bills, the House Bill 410, it looks like they amended the, the requirement to return to the number of polling places pre-pandemic that's been amended out that would have increased the number of polling places here in Carroll County and obviously an added expense uh, there. Um, MAKO is asking for a study of this. All of the education uh, associations are in opposition to it. So that's one that we'll see. Will be Monday, we'll, we'll know for sure. Um, the minimum compensation bill, uh, the election bill, that looks like that, that may move as well, still sitting in the Senate. Uh, the county commissioner districts, that tweaking of the commissioner districts, um, that House version is still in rules, and so there are still some procedural hurdles to get that one out. And then the, uh, the recount bill, again, the committee has not moved that bill, uh, but we're at a time now where the committees are not even putting on the website mm -hmm. their, their voting what, what bills they're voting on, they're just coming, uh, coming quickly. So we'll, we'll have to see how, how these all flesh out. And let's see. The Public Information Act, uh, the two, two bills that uh, relate to body-worn cameras, uh, it looks like the the first, which is Senate Bill 40, that's the one that tries to put a limit on uh, how much data can be released under a PIA. Uh, that's passed the Senate, had a hearing this week. Uh, we'll see if that moves. Chances are it will. Mm -hmm. uh, same with Senate Bill 330, <clears throat> Senator Reedy's bill uh, to have the state uh, act as a the conduit to purchase these these systems uh, the, we talked in detail about the the school bus violations bill and my thought was we may see some amending regarding the revenue from those bills that doesn't seem to be the case in fact uh, it seems that that committee is not really interested in moving the ball forward so that's a good thing uh, the police retention work group, again, passed the Senate, has not yet moved in the House. Uh, Senate Bill 650 and House Bill 789. So this was the bill that would create a new fund that would be able to, uh, to issue no-cost or low-cost loans to local governments and to businesses and individuals if we had a localized public uh, localized uh, disaster that was not declared uh, as such. There is a fund in the uh, there is a fund in the state now, and that existing fund is for a state response. The bill changed between chambers in the Senate. It kept that Public Safety State Disaster Recovery Fund. In the House, they renamed it the Catastrophic Event Account, and that uses the existing fund, doesn't create a new one. Uh, it adds local governments, so local governments can tap into that. The problem is that's the reason the original bill existed, because that fund is full of hurdles, and you can't turn the money around quickly. The Senate bill moves that, that existing fund into this new fund. So the, the Senate bill is the, is the preference here, but again, that's got to get worked out. 
still not not settled. Those those two bills still exist in the form they were passed in each chamber. Uh, looks like the commission to advance and strengthen firefighting and EMS is going to pass. It's been voted out of uh, passed the Senate and got voted out in the in the House. Um, lastly, under Public Works, the the recycling task force looks like again got out of one house still sitting in the other there are two programs that are still in play not not on your listing but that's the paint stewardship program where there's a small fee attached at the retail level and then the local government would no longer be involved in recycling paint that would be recycled at the retailer and the producer packaging bill where the producer has to uh, try to reduce recyclable packaging, uh, that one is still in play as well. So these last couple of days, it's going to be a busy weekend for the General Assembly. Um, there's, this is going to be one that goes up to midnight on sine die for a lot of these bills. Um, as soon as I can get some clarity on the budget, I'll get that to you. And then I'll be back next Thursday with, as uh, I used to say, the lovely totals. <laughs> used to say, I think it was Joe Angel used to say that about the Orioles. The love, back with the lovely totals. And the, uh, actually, it's uh, opening day at Camden Yards tomorrow, tomorrow right? right? They postponed it. Doesn't look like it's rain, but Not that's yet. right. No. Um, any questions? Mr. Fowler, we'll yes. see you on Monday. Just so. thank you for keeping us up to date on everything and keeping us apprised of everything that's unfolding. <laughs> and right now it's unfolding quickly. Yeah. I don't know what's, what I'm going to see when I get back to the desk, actually. So. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, Chris, is there anybody on the phone? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Anything for open admin? Wanda, why don't you come on up? Let's go through agendas. Hello again, Wanda. Hello again, everyone. <laughs> okay. We have Good Friday tomorrow and Easter on Sunday. On Monday is April 10th, Westminster City Council meeting. Um, whether you're attending or not, I don't know. But I haven't decided yet, but I may be. Um, we have open session on Tuesday, April 11th, down in the Reagan Room. It'll be a work session, uh, and is scheduled for both the morning and afternoon. For work sessions, I have an Ag Center board meeting at 7 p.m., and also it'll be combined with the 4-H Achievement Program. Commissioner Kyler and I will be attending. On Wednesday, Farm Museum board meeting, Commissioner Vigliotti will be attending, and then I'll be participating in the Board of Education board meeting that afternoon at 5 p.m. On Thursday, we have open session. Um, it'll be the final legislative update from Mr. Fowler. We will talk about submitting application accepting award for FY24 summer supplemental it, it's snap program so it'll come out of um miss deckel and dcs fy 24 uh, block grant again from dcs and then request approval and grant application for new windsor wetland construction plans coming out of land resource management and then he will mr hine be talking about roberts field restoration construction and then as we were briefed on the hazard mitigation plan, it will be opportunity to adopt the 2022 Carroll County hazard mitigation plan. Um, then Ms. Hawkins will talk about emergency responder radio communications system. And then DPW will talk about the farm museum lighting. We will uh, have a conversation from Ms. Hobbs and uh, regarding legal services and bond counsel. 
independent financial auditing services from Ms. Hobbs, and she'll still be up there for financial advisor services. And she will finish off the morning dealing with uh, uncollectible personal property tax accounts. We will then go into closed um, at, should I say what the close is? Does it matter? Public safety. For public safety. That's it. Um, we will then have a work session um, after closed at 11.15 down in 20, 23 or down in 003, excuse me, and then we'll follow up uh, again with um, work session at 1 p.m. and we'll go into close for land acquisition. <coughs> On Friday, April 14th, we have the business breakfast down in Tony Town. Commissioner Vigliotti, Kyler, and I will be attending. Uh, special guest will be Mr. Anderson, Secretary of Commerce. Battle of the Books um, at Century High School that evening, where I'll be emceeing. And then two other Battle of Books, one at uh, Manchester Valley with Commissioner Kyler, and one at Westminster High School with Commissioner Gordon. And then Commissioner Gordon will be attending the Westminster Baseball Program opening day. And there'll be a ribbon cutting at Sweet Bay, Sweet Hay, Sweet Hay. Bay, I think. Bay, I, oh, my glasses, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Sweet Bay Farms Nursery and Garden Center, Westminster. And Commissioner Gurin has the podcast. On April 17th, we have a ribbon cutting for MAGIC uh, New Autonomous Robotics Innovation Center in Westminster. Commissioner Gordon is attending. And then Tuesday, down in the Reagan Room is the Planning and Zoning Commission. Commissioner Gordon will be attending, participating in. At 1 p.m., we have a work session scheduled and then a Veterans Advisory meeting at 2 p.m. Commissioner Gordy and Kyler are scheduled to attend. On Wednesday, the Community College Board of Trustees. Who attends that? You attend that, right? Well, that's uh, Commissioner Kyler. Commissioner Kyler attends the Board of Trustees meeting. And then the Board of Education Town Hall will be at Winner's Mill um, and currently we have Commissioner Gordon attending that. And I plan to go following the community college. Okay. Um, and can add Commissioner Kyler. And then the ESAC, Emergency Services Advisory Council, Commissioner Garen will be participating at 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Thursday, we have open session. We talk about some paving and some more paving and a waiver for Manchester annexation number 41, Patapsco 91 LLC. And then um, talk about the NPDES program and our permits associated with it. On Friday, I will be attending the Baltimore Metropolitan Council. Um, you're attending that as well? No, to my knowledge, no. I thought maybe yeah, is that I Commissioner Kyler? No, I think it's yeah, just me. Just you? Okay. Yeah, yeah so you take Commissioner Gordon off that. Um, and then on Saturday is the Westminster Fire Department's 200th anniversary banquet at Pleasant. It's Westminster's Fire Department's 200th anniversary banquet at Pleasant Valley Fire Hall. That's a good partnership. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, Commissioner Vigliotti and I are scheduled to attend. May have some time if there's others attending Wanda, well. you can add me as well to that. Commissioner Gordon will be attending that as well. And and while we're talking, should we, I guess we should have a proclamation drawn up for it because it's the 200th anniversary. Sounds like a plan. And then I'll be doing the podcast on the 23rd. What I need is a motion going to recess for uh, to you can start anytime you want. So, I mean, 
it, I, um, Talk about you better. <laughs> well, so right now, that's fine. So right now, we can go into recess, talk for an hour, go into recess, come back, or we can go in recess for an hour, come back, and then go as far as we want, and then adjourn for the day. Is there a preference? All right, walk me through that one more time. I'm sorry. <laughs> we can either recess for a chunk of time and then start work session adjourn for the day or we can recess go for an hour take a break and then come back and then adjourn for the day so it's either what, whatever you all want to do yeah you can basically take 10 15 minutes now and go downstairs and set up for for the budget and then do a lunch you know break in, in around noon um, to one and then come back or do you want to take a longer break at the moment and then just I mean if we don't your need, lunch if, and break yeah, if we don't need a long break then my recommendation is that we recess for 15 minutes get down to the Reagan room and start the conversation I would support that okay so, so I need a motion to recess to 1045 and reconvene down to Reagan room 003 for budget work session. So moved. Second. Okay. Everybody agree? Say yeah. aye.